Hi everybody, welcome to another LCD DWF repair video. This is the second part of Mr. Lee's Commodore 4016 repair. If you haven't watched the part 1 repair, I suggest you first do it, to get an idea what are the issues and what was fixed so far. A link to it is in the description. Part 1 ended after identifying a short circuit between pin 4 and pin 13 under a DRAM socket. At this point I'm checking the various signals that go to the RAM ICs and we'll start now from another bad one. At this point I decided to have a look at the other RAM signals and indeed also the right enable has issues. This time the zero level is too high, which is uncommon. The RAM right signal is driven by UE15 and indeed every single gate on that IC showed the same wrong zero level. Usually this happens when the IC is missing its ground connection. And yes, it's indeed missing. This is another fault caused by pulling and socketing otherwise fine ICs. We can clearly see the missing trace that connected the ground pin to the nearby ground rail. I've then restored the missing connection by adding a generous amount of solder. And now the zero level is back to zero. And the RAM still doesn't work at all. Now, since all other addresses and control signals were looking good, I decided to try my dynamic RAM in circuit tester on the few non-socketed 4116 IC remained. If you haven't seen already this little tester, I have put a link to the repair video where I first showed and described it. When the IC under test is good, the scope trace must stay high. However, on UA19 it's mostly low. So I pulled UA19, always double checking that I'm not introducing more faults, and replaced it with a good spare. This time at least it's a dress 8 band, so I think it's progress. Since at this point no more ICs showed any issue with the dynamic RAM tester, I decided to check the address 8 line. This address line goes to pin number 6 of every RAM IC during the column address phase. And yes, if we look at UA5 pin 6, it seems floating. On UA7, pin 6 shows normal activity. Yeah, only noise on UA5. So this was probably a marginal connection that didn't show as missing during the first check. In any case, I've added another jumper to restore the continuity. However, this didn't yet fix this path. Always address 8 at bad, and this time I'm sure that every RAM I see is getting address 8 line. I think I'll try again with the dynamic RAM tester, just out of desperation. Oddly enough, now UA11 looks bad. The first time I tried, I'm sure it looked ok. Since I'm not yet sure if I'm going to pull U11 or not, I decided to remove the RAM ROM daughter board and see if there is enough good RAM for the basic to start. Well, almost, but at least this kind of error usually indicates a RAM issue. So, not having any better clue, I decided to pull your A11. However, at the beginning of this repair, I had to bridge a broken trace right next to your A11. After soldering the new socket, I had to restore the missing connection on the other side of the PCB. 
Well, this is definitely progress. Let me connect the keyboard. Hmm, even the keyboard interface seems to have issues. Some keys work, but many don't. Since at the beginning of this repair I had to substitute all the 40 pins IO ICs, I know for sure that the 6520 PIA works fine, so the obvious suspect for the keyboard problem is UC11 in this case. Luckily this was an easy one, a pin was bent, so I just need to straighten the pin and reinsert it into the socket again. And now all the keys work fine. We can focus again on the main run problem. The basic is reporting 7192 bytes free, as if it had only 8 kilobytes of total RAM, and not 16 kilobytes, as it currently only has the IC of the first bank installed. Of course, I could simply call it a PET 4008 and be done with the repair. I'm just kidding, of course. Let's try to find which RAM I see is misbehaving with the help of the machine language monitor. The first 8 kilobytes segment ends at the X address 1FFF. When the basic starts, it fills the RAM area with the hexadecimal byte AA to discover the available amount of free bytes. Let's check now what we find on the second 8 kilobyte segment that starts at the hexadecimal address 2000. We see the AA values but also some A2 bytes that give us a big clue. The difference between AA and A2 is only on B3, so we must look on the schematic what I see holds that bit. On the lower 16 kilobytes bank, which is the one selected by cast 0, data bus bit number 3 is going to UA13, so this is our problematic IC. Of course, on a situation like this, where some broken traces were already found, it's important to check that UA13 is getting all needed signals before deciding to pull it. Since I found no issues on all traces going to UA13, the old RAM IC has been pulled and substituted with a new one. So far so good, the basic now sees 15,359 bytes free. If we now check the RAM content right across the end of the first 16K bank, we find all the AA bytes up to 3FFF and then the value of 40 at the start of the second bank. This is normal since no ICs are installed on the second bank yet, and the 6502 sees a value equal to the high byte of the address when reading on a floating data bus. Also, with this simple basic statement, we can check whether or not the bytes free amount is correct for a 16 kilobyte machine, and it's indeed correct. Now the time has arrived to populate also the second 16 kilobytes RAM bank with good ICs and see what happens. So far, so good! Finally! It is almost time to run the usual tests to check all the IO ports of this pad. However, I have decided to first secure all the added wires with a drop of epoxy. This ensures that the wires cannot be pulled by accident. Notice this jumper that was originally going straight. I decided to reroute it to avoid the epoxy to touch too many IC pins as, for example, it happened on this other one. If there is the need to solder again on the nearby pins, we will need to remove first any excess epoxy in this case. 
This is especially important on the worst socket installations. It's again broken, it only sees half the RAM now. Looking again with the machine language monitor at the 4000 address, which is the start of the second 16K bank, we see a 2A byte. And if we do again the same exercise to find the bad bit, now we get a bad number 7. Data bit 7 on the CAS1 RAM bank points to UA4IC, but all the bank 1 ICs are good verified on stock ones, so it must be probably another intermittent trace. And indeed, UA4 developed another broken trace on pin 6. This is definitely the worst reworked socket on this pet motherboard. I've added another wire to restore the connection. Fortunately, that was the last issue on this pet. It ran the memory test for more than one hour, and it even survived its trip back to England. So that's all for this repair video. I hope you learned something new. If you have any questions, please use the comment section below. Have a nice time and thank you for watching.